Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. The episode this week takes us to 1932 France. On the 6th of May 1932, Paul Dumer, who was the 13th president of the Third Republic, is assassinated by a Russian called Pavel Gorgulov with two bullets, one of them have been through his head. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I'm very aware of the fact that the monarchy had been shortened. I mean, it was very famous. But I wasn't aware that there were any presidents who had lost their lives. Yeah, there's been many. Um, well, some of them also died by accident, like... Uh, Mm, I can't remember his name now, who fell from a train, allegedly. Oh, dear. Um, that was ne- the 30s as well, 20s, but it's not considered uh, an assassination. Okay. Just a very dangerous time to be president of France. Yeah, well, also there's some of them were very stupid. He was in the arms of his mistress and somehow fell off the train. But How, how terribly French, how <laughs> cliched. He died in, in his mistress's arms. Yeah. But the, the um, yeah, there's been several assassinations in the 20th century. One official assassination, loads of attempts. Um, mm. Five on the goal, for example. Oh yeah. But most of the assassinations were before the 20th century. Yeah, the Gaulle's very much like the European Castro, because there's a lot of assassination attempts yeah. on Castro. Yeah, yeah, it's all because of uh, Algeria. Ah yes, of course. So uh, in 1932, Suzanne Dutch who's a rich woman from the east of France, mm-hmm. gives her estate to the state. The state, okay. It's located about 70 kilometers of Paris in Boulogne. Yeah. And it currently hosts a recovery house for flying army personnel. Okay, so it's like a, an RAF convalescent home. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's 1932, so at the moment it's not very busy, but yeah. it um, started being used in the First World War, as far as I remember. Mm, yeah. as, as far as I remember the story, the state asked her if they could use it because she wasn't using the house. Okay. And they started using it in the First World War because it was convenient in terms of location and they continued using it and yeah. eventually she gave it to the state. Well, that's nice. Yeah, it reminds me of the of Dusty Park in Aberdeen. Paul Dumer, who is then the president of France, is totally fascinated by everything aviation. He mm. loves plane. Okay, and so he's, I mean, he's a I mean, relatively new invention. Yeah, in 1932, yeah, it would be 30 years old or something. So mm. it's a bit like us and, well, it's not even like us and rockets because rockets are even older than that. Mm. Uh, like us and the internet, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. In terms of age, so yes. I mean, it certainly changed the way we travelled and also uh, warfare as well. Yes. So because he's so interested in aviation, he insisted to open officially the house on the 2nd of April 1932. Mm-hmm. On the way there, he travels with Léon Noël, who is then the chief of security and the secretary of interior ministry. So home office secretary, but not the actual secretary, like the home office secretary secretary. Oh, right. Okay. A but deputy, also head of the secret deputy service home office as well. Minister, I guess. Also head of the secret service yes. as well. That's... Yes. Dual job. Yeah, but not inconceivable because it's in in, in interior ministry or home Mm -hmm. ministry that is responsible for that. So it makes sense. During the trip, Dumer is surprised by all the organization and all the measures that have been taken. Mm. He sees lots of um, people blocking the streets and, and all that for him to go through. Okay. And to him, they appear unnecessary and superfluous. Oh dear. Noel explains that these are to make sure that nothing slows him down so that he's on time. Uh-huh. And that's especially true for intersections. They don't want him to stop in intersections. Yeah. We now know that when secret services do that, it's because they don't want it to be shot at a red light, for example. Yeah. yeah. But at the time, it obviously wasn't that common, so he didn't click very quickly. No. Well, that's, uh, isn't that what happened to uh, Franz Ferdinand, wasn't it? Because they, they changed the and route. And it was a traffic jam, as far as I remember. Yeah, and they changed the route. And yeah, they changed the route, and then they got stuck in the traffic jam mm-hmm. in front of the cafe where... Where the um, assassin was eating. Yeah, he was having a drink. Mm-hmm. Um, what was his name? I can't remember. No, now. I can't remember either. I've yeah. just exposed our ignorance, the <laughs> shame of it. Of course, everybody remembers Franz Ferdinand, but do they remember the name of the guy who shot him? Oh, how how annoying. It, I don't remember it, but yeah. It, it, and he just couldn't believe his eyes when the car mm. actually stopped in front of him. <laughs> yes. 
And yeah, because he had not managed to do it in where the location was supposed to be yeah. because the car was changed. Yeah. It's just, okay. I have Pavel in my head, but anyway, I can't, I can't remember his name. It doesn't matter. So anyway, Dumia d- doubts the explanations because he thinks that's not usual. Mm, fishy. And he thinks about it for a while and he says, at my age, being assassinated would be a good way to go. <laughs> So that's he knows a, that's why a, they're doing that. That's a dark, uh, dark way to look at things. Yeah, but he was quite old at the time. Um, must have been in his seventies or something like that. Oh, that's young for a uh, U.S. president. For U.S. president, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was quite old for for a president. The presidents mm-hmm. in the Third Republic were quite old usually because the role of the president wasn't really an executive role; it was a representation role. So the queen, essentially. Okay, so it so was, it was common for yeah. fairly old people to have that role. You want them to be stately, but they don't need to be. Yeah, exactly. Too yeah. sharp of mind because they they don't have any legitimate power. Yeah, he has no power, but they know they, know they have no power, so yeah. they, just, they just can't take any decision. Mm. They, they're just there for sure, like the president in uh, in Germany and this kind of stuff. They just or the president in Italy, they have really no role apart mm. from opening the parliament and going to state dinners, and that's about it. Yeah. So it was very different at the time. Very much like a monarchy, but with less bling. So they don't have crowns. Yes, and it's just a job. So yeah. you get it. You get elected for a number of years, and mm. I don't remember how many years it was at the time. And then probably seven years, I assume. Mm-hmm. And then somebody else got the job. Yeah. So after him, it was Lebrun. Before him, it might have been Oriol. I can't remember all the presidents. So a few weeks later, at the end of April 1932, Edouard Julien, a member of staff of Dumer, mm-hmm. that uh, he met 30 years earlier in Indo- Indochina because the president was the governor of Indochina in the early 20th century. Did France have a big presence in, well, other than Vietnam? As well, it was Vietnam, Vietnam Laos, Cambodia, All right, okay, so and bits okay. of India mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Like Pondicherry and I can't remember what the others were. But yeah, so- quite a lot. So they certainly had the, the looming presence that uh, the UK had as well, and Great Britain at the time. Yes, the yeah, yeah. So he was a governor in China, so he met that mm-hmm. guy um, over there at the time. And he mentions that the president is taking risks by meeting people and crowds unprotected. Mm-hmm. So once again, Dumer answers that by saying that at his age, that would be a better way, what better way of falling than falling for your country? So again, he's happy to die for the country, being assassinated. He's already falling on his metaphorical sword. Yeah, but at, at the same time, it's not, it's not considered posturing. It's, this, it's really considered that he actually believed that. Mm. And, and he got a self-fulfilling prophecy, right, obviously. Yeah, obviously, yes. If we're talking about him. Yes. Um, but no, he was totally dedicated, dedicated to the country, and his whole family was, because four of his sons died during first world, the First World War. Mm. So, so it was. He was actually believing what he was saying. He yeah. was actually happy to die for the country and well, yeah, had no guess, problem with that. I, I mean, I guess nationalism was was kind of like really rife and. Uh, well, not so much in thirty two. It was starting in thirty two, hmm. um, but it it wasn't as bad as it was at the end of the thirties. Yes, no, but no. in thirty two, no, it no. wasn't too bad yet. There wasn't really people. Yes. It was starting because things were hitting, like the financial crisis mm. was just reaching France at the time, okay, the 1929 yeah. one. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't really a big thing yet, but there was yeah. lots of small groups around that then would become bigger groups yeah. and take uh, part. that lead to the Vichy government. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, he believed in sacrifice mm. and he used to say that to live well, he had to be, to be ready to die. <laughs> okay. I don't think that would be a modern uh, concept of of how how leaders see see themselves now. Probably not, because most of them haven't been in a war for a start, as he had been. So okay. he had been in 1971, yeah. plus his son had been in his First World War and mm. died there. So that was very different. Now most of the people in power were born after the First World War, so they've never been in one. No. Or a small one away from home, so it wasn't yeah. really... It, it, it wasn't the same kind of world at the time. Mm. War was a real thing. War would, could happen. Well, war could happen now because of Ukraine. But Yeah, I was just sort of thinking that. War was always a possibility. Yeah. Lots of people had been in it. So it was normal to, mm. to think about that. And it's a bit different now. On the 1st of May 1932, his close collaborators find him worried. They see him hesitate going out for his daily morning walk. 
which normally was no problem because mm -hmm. you just walked in the streets <laughs> without thinking about it. And I understand when they see the letter that he's holding, he received death threats signed from a foreign sounding name. Okay. But he dismisses it by saying that it's nothing, nothing to worry about. <laughs> but yeah, obviously his actions kind of like give him away a bit. Yeah, well, yes, yes. He was worried about it, yeah. which was probably the first time. Yeah. A few days later, the Paris 8th District Police received a letter from a colonel who came back from Berlin, who was posted in Berlin, and he came back with information that he gave to the police saying that he had good reasons to believe that an assassination was going to be attempted against the president very soon. Okay. I'm sure a lot of presidents receive crackpot mail and are, are, are continually... Sent, I don't uh, know. I don't know. Maybe less at the time. I really have no idea. I've never really wanted that. You think there was more of a respect for authority then? I don't know. I know some people have made threats against Macron and ended up in prison straight away. Mm. So, but I'd never heard of threats against other presidents before him. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it's that common now or, or then. He didn't like long lunches. But on that day, he specifically requested that the lunch wouldn't drag on because at 3 p.m., he really wanted to be at the uh, Combatant Writer Festival, okay. which was a festival about ex-soldiers that were writing novels and books and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And it was opening, and he was asked to open it. And he really loved that kind of stuff. Yeah. And also, he wanted to be surrounded by people he knew because the ex combatants were really people that combated with him yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's and so being surrounded by writers and let, uh, people of letters and stuff was really what he loved. So I so really wanted to be there. So the lunch couldn't last very long. It didn't matter if he was having lunch with presidents and ministers. It, what was important was the opening of the, the festival. Yeah, it's kind of weird that uh, you get a Frenchman who's wanting to cut lunch short. I've never heard of that. That uh, that festival takes place in the 8th district of Paris. Okay. Coincidence. No, no, no relation with the fact that that's where the colonel gave the, uh, the information to the police. Mm -hmm. In uh, It was in a hotel, that hotel as in Paris Hotel, which is not an actual hotel where you rent a room. It's private houses. Big private houses are called hotels in Paris. Okay. That used to be owned by Balzac and has disappeared since and was rebuilt differently. Oh, okay, so, so it's not there anymore. Okay. Dumier usually avoids all these outings, but it was an exception. So he, all his security people were really on, on edge. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not something he normally did mm. and mm, you never know what could happen. At about 2 p.m., there's a Russian visitor that arrives at the festival. He arrives very early. In fact, he's the first one to arrive. Okay. And the staff joke about it. And they say, oh, you're, you're our lucky charm. You're the first to arrive. Uh-oh. <laughs> but he's quickly spotted as having a strange behavior because he buys two books and then just stands ne next to one of the tables for the rest of the time. So for more than an hour, not, not doing anything, not talking to anyone, just stands there. So he's just like casing the joint. I don't know if he was casing the drunk. I think he was just waiting. Mm. And the staff is kind of worried a little bit because they don't understand what he's doing there. Yeah. Having been that early, especially. Mm. When the president arrives, he's asked to move so that the president has room okay. with his group. And traditionally, the prefect of Paris, so that's the chief of police in Paris, yeah. and the Elysee chief of security walk in front of the president but Dumer being Dumer, he oh, dismissed to... them and told them to move away because he wanted to move, move freely in the crowd. Mm -hmm. So he they're not in front of him. He wants to be with these peeps. Yeah, and they're not in front of him this time. He says that he prefers to be shoved around a little bit by the crowd than shoving other people. Okay. So he walks across the first room of the exhibition, and as he's about to enter the second room, two gunfires are heard. He falls to the ground. Three more I heard, and it, to people who are there, the witnesses say it felt like it, it wasn't stopping. And there was gunfire after gunfire, All so right, there's several okay. more that are fired after that. Mm -hmm. One of the bullets enters the base of his skull and exits at the temple. Not good. Another enters under the arm and came out above the shoulder. Okay. And that... The second one cut the auxiliary artery oh, and created no. a massive hemorrhage, oh, which dear. wasn't spotted at the time. 
So he's taken to the nearest hospital. Okay. When he gets there, he's lost two, li- he's lost two liters of blood already. That's a lot. Out of five, yes. He's <laughs> getting close to half, so yeah. yeah, that is not good. The staff is totally unprepared and they can't believe who's in front of them. They didn't expect it. Now, if the president is somewhere, I'm pretty sure the hospital is notified and they, are, like, they clear the area and I they wait for so. him to, to come. Yeah, definitely. At the time, no. no. It's just, where's the nearest hospital? Let's go there. Yeah. But they vow to save him. Unfortunately, the early actions taken by the hospital staff will be taught later as typically the sort of stuff you should not do. Oh, that's not good. Yes. In particular, they take a very long time to concentrate on the wound, on, wound under the arm, probably because they were obsessed by the one in the head, which was probably more, I don't know, worrying for, to them or impressive. Yeah, I mean, if, if you say to somebody, oh, I've got a head wound and I've been shot on my torso underneath my arm, I mean, you would automatically think the head wound would be the one you should look at first. Yeah, that's obviously what they thought. Yeah. But I mean, I'm but not a doctor. But they're supposed to be trained, so. trained doctors. Yeah. We're not, so no. they should know. But the hemorrhage could have been stopped and the artery mm-hmm. clamped. Yeah. But instead, they spend too much time doing other things. Oh, dear. As the doctors try to save him, he comes and goes out of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And at some point, as he wakes up, he asks, it wasn't a Frenchman, was it? Because... For him being killed by a Frenchman would have been the worst thing ever. Yeah. Um, so he's told that no, he wasn't, he wasn't French, so he's happy to die at that point. He's happy to die at the hands of a yes. foreigner. Or yes, he's less disappointed than if it had been a French person. Mm-hmm. The news broadcasts over the, is broadcast over the wireless, which was beginning at the time, mm-hmm. and the whole nation hears about the assassination very quickly. That's the first time it happens. Okay. The previous assassination was... Uh, Cotty, maybe? Uh, in 1895, he was stabbed. But and at the time, there was no quick news. So part of the country probably to find out learned about it weeks later. Yeah. Or at least days later, minimum. But because there's the wireless and mm. newspapers it's now. It's instant. It's instant. Everybody knows about it straight away. The newspapers, who at the time had several editions, several editions a day. Um, I know Le Monde had three, but some had two, up to five. Wow couldn't cope with the demand. They were just printing, 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 mm. and the, the papers were disappearing even before they got to the shelves. Wow. People wanted to know what had happened. And that's not even counting the special issues, which were also published at the same time just oh, yeah, online. Of course, of course. In parallel to that news stream, the Interior Minister also issues updates on a regular basis, but mm. hourly. In the middle of the night, he informs everybody that the condition of the president has deteriorated. Mm due to injury at the base of the, of the skull, which is probably not true. Then an hour later, he informs people that the president is in a coma. And at 4.37, he announced that the president is dead. Okay. 13 hours after being shot, Paul Dumer is dead in the hospital. Mm. Very quickly, some doctor complained anonymously about how he was cared for, saying that the first action that should have been taken was clamping the artery and stop the massive a hemorrhage. Mm. He could have received a blood transfusion and in a modern hospital with modern equipment and trained staff, he had no reason to die. Yeah. Some of them say that a random person from the street in a field hospital would not have died of those wounds and the president did. It was pure incompetence. Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it, really? Yes. They think that they didn't think it was a good idea. Yeah, to know. stop the bleeding before they Yeah, went maybe the bleeding. head wound looked impressive and they're just obsessed with that, mm. thinking, oh, we need to save the brain or whatever. But mm. at the same time, he was emptying himself under the arm mm. internally. So yeah. they didn't notice and it was too late when they did. I mean, there's just so many main arteries in your body that, I mean, if you cut, that's it. Yeah, but they're You're... doctors. They're supposed to know how to deal with yeah. that. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. So the assassin is Gorgulov. That's his surname. He's arrested. Straight away, obviously, because he was surrounded by security people in, of course. The, in the room. Yeah, well, I can imagine. But it, it, they, even in the small time it took them to get to him, he was already being lynched by the crowd. So he was saved by the police, otherwise he would be dead very quickly. Ah, right, okay. He was still holding the handgun he had used to kill the president at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was a Browning S15 centimeters, apparently, from Belgium. Okay. And the police finds another one in his pocket. So he had two. And these were the 
top of the line handgun at the time. And that's one of the questions people have. How did he get his hands on it? Because that was an army gun. So only army personnel had that gun. And mm. because it was top of the line, only some army personnel had it. Mm -hmm. How did he get two of those? Mm. That's a question that's never answered. All right, we don't okay. know how he got these guns. Very quickly, rumors start spreading, obviously. Of course. They try to explain how he could have been armed in such a way, how he could have been aware of the movements of the presidents and mm. all these questions. The fingers are pointed at the Russian community in France, obviously, because he was Russian. Oh, well, yeah. Especially since in the first few years of the 1930s, 2.7 million immigrants were allowed to settle in France from mm. Eastern Europe, especially Russia. Yeah, so I mean, there after were, the uh, revolution. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a huge wave of them all trying to get out when the uh, revolution kicked in. Yeah, well, there was a civil war in Russia after the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the white armies, as they were called, lost in the early 20s. And that's after that that people started to immigrate, leaving Russia. Yeah. I have to say, um, my only real reference to that time in uh, Russian history is uh, my love of Dr. Zhivago. So <laughs> I'm not that well versed, but yeah, I know that the, the, right, uh, the fighting... And the civil war between the, the whites and the reds happened yeah. around about that time. Also, more and more often, reports reach the police that fascists have infiltrated the Russian groups. Okay. And they could be used to plot assassinations, mm. coup or whatever. So the atmosphere is not very good against the Russian at the time. They discover that Gogolov is the founder and only member of a Russian fascist party <laughs> as well. Which adds to the suspicions. Mm. He's, however, presented in the press as an anarchist, because as far as the press is concerned at the time, only anarchists can kill presidents. And that was the case in the previous assassination, assassinations, but not in this one. Okay. A party of one just seems a bit unhinged. Well, not even unhinged, a bit sad. It is a bit sad, yes. Yeah. If he tried... Uh, I remember reading in the newspapers that he tried to organize meetings to convince people to join and it just didn't work. People weren't interested at all no. at the time. Um, mainly because the the Russian community was trying to integrate in France so yeah. they didn't really want to go to extreme left or right and no. start making waves. Yeah. So they were all keeping quiet. They mm. just weren't interested yeah. in doing any of those things. Yeah, they're thinking, just shut your mouth, son. Just enjoy yeah. the freedom and... Uh, Get on with it. Yes, exactly. So he's led to the central police station and interrogated mm -hmm. by, you might guess, Marcel Guillaume, which we heard in episode 29, the Yay. model for Maigret. Maigret. Mm -hmm. Dur during the interrogation, he's replaced by the investigating judge that's appointed to lead the inquiry okay. called Fougerie. I mean, it's not really surprising that there are high-profile people working. On this yes, case. yes, it, it makes sense. But during the, in the interrogation, which lasts 24 hours, as far as I remember, he doesn't say much, really. Mm. He just talks to himself, mumbles, and repeats his own writings, which are found in his flat. Mm -hmm. None of them make any kind of sense. They're like mystical, political crap. <laughs> So they were basically a bit Ted Krasinski style manifesto of um, an unhinged. Probably, but probably much crazier than that. Because he was an intelligent person, so he was oh, writing yes, intelligently. Was, yeah. He's crazy. Mm. So what he says makes no sense whatsoever. It's just all, okay. it's just all made up in his head. Yeah. He's sent to the Santé prison hospital mm -hmm. because they think he's totally crazy. Okay. So they don't send him straight to prison. There he continues to be interrogated, of course, because at the time you didn't have limitations, so you could no. be interrogated for a few days. No, he couldn't just confess to it to get home and watch the WWE. Yes, exactly. Poor old Brandon Darcy. Yes. He maintains the whole time that he acted alone and he had the irresistible need to save Russia from the Bolsheviks. I don't think that would have any relevance on the Bolsheviks, you shooting somebody from another country. Well, exactly. He was asked about that, what, uh, what, does ha you know, what it has to do with the yeah, French Yeah, what's president. your motivation? Come on. Exactly. And he explains that France is an accomplice of the Russian government, the Reds. Okay. 
because it abandoned the white armies, which is not true because they were provided in material and weapons and ammunition mm. by of the West. Of course they were, of course. They but were. anyway, um, and then the French government recognized the Bolshevik, the, what he calls the Bolshevik regime in mm. 1924, and after that signed treaties with the USSR. So he considers France as an accomplice. So that's I see. why he decided, yeah, well, we killed the president. Rather than killing the uh, the head of uh, Russia, let's go and yes. kill one of the, uh, the, pre the perceived allies. Exactly. Mm. The police has huge difficulty finding who he is, because of course he's Russian. There's mm. no records of anything. Even in Russia, they'll probably be destroyed anyway. Oh, yeah. So that's they managed to find his mum somehow. <laughs> Okay, that's weird. And they send someone to interrogate the mum. So they learn that he's born on 29th of June, 1895, in the Caucasus somewhere. Mm. After World War I, where he would have been wounded to the head by the grenade and would have his between quotes because nobody's sure about it. There's no proof of it. Okay. He starts medicine studies. When in 1917 the revolution starts, he sides with the white armies mm -hmm. and he acts as an auxiliary doctor, a field doctor. Okay. Although at the time he's not a doctor yet. No. After the white armies lose the civil war, he emigrates to Poland first. Well, then, he's lucky enough that he got out alive. Yes. Yeah, especially if he was in the field hospitals, you probably would have noticed. Oh, yeah. He managed to escape somehow. Then he moves to Czechoslovakia in 1921. Mm-hmm. There, he starts his studies again. So he's moving south. He's moving west. Yes. Well, west and then southwest a little bit, yes. but mostly mm -hmm. west. He becomes a doctor in 1926 in Czechoslovakia, and he opens his own surgery, okay. who's known there as a surgery that practices illegal abortions. In the meantime, he gets married, and it took me a while to understand what they meant in the newspapers when they said that he was bigamist twice. He wasn't bigamist and then bigamist again. He was bigamist and bigamist at the same time. He was four times. He had three wives. That's just a glutton for punishment, that is. Three wives? Yeah. Three mounts of nagging. Who needs that? Yes. And when they are contacted, they explain that he was beating them up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice he sounds like a real charmer. Yeah. When there, he publishes poems and books and manifestos for what he calls the Green Fascist Party, but don't understand green as ecologic, it's just a color. Okay. Could have been purple or blue right. or whatever, it didn't matter. Nobody has any idea what green means. I have to say, it is, if you're publishing manifestos, I would consider yourself a noon. Yeah, I guess so, especially when you're on your own, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you're not part of a party and you publish no. the manifesto of the party. Yeah. You, on your own, and you publish manifestos. Yes, you're probably, yeah, if, you're probably if, nuts. If you're a single voice out in the lone, mm -hmm. screaming into the void, means you're nuts. Yeah. The newspapers in Czechoslovakia don't take him seriously at all. They mm -hmm. make fun of him. And according to some, that's what convinced him that he needed to impose his idea with a big bang. So that's when he decided, I'm going to assassinate someone. Okay. According to them. That will get everyone's attention. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. He is kicked out of Czechoslovakia in 1930, so he immigrates to France at that point. Okay. In France, he stays first with a group of Russian immigrants for a while, and then he settles in the hotel. This time we're talking room An actual hotel. hotel. Okay. Where he opens a new surgery again. Right. He is kicked out of France on the, in December 1931 for illegal practice of medicine, <laughs> because, of course, he's not a doctor in France. Yeah, have to re well, at least re register, to retrain and re register, presumably. Yeah, I guess, or have your diplomas transcribed or something. Mm. I, I don't know how it works. There must be some kind of system, but uh, no, he doesn't do any other. He no. just opens his surgery and says, I'm a doctor. Mm. So that didn't fly. He comes back on the 4th of May, 1932. On the 5th of May, he's seen praying for hours at Notre Dame, and then he goes and gets drunk. And on the 6th, he goes to the book exhibition we talked about, mm -hmm. and we know what happened afterwards. Yeah. The name he uses to buy his ticket for the book exhibition is Paul Bread. The surname is important. We'll talk about it later. Okay. Is that yeah. bread or pan? It's B-R-E-D-E. -E. Okay. So bread. Not bread, bread not like it, as, in, as in bread, yes. The, no, not the one you eat. After all that, the Russian community is very worried that the same backlash might happen 
like happened against the Italian community when Sadi Kano was stabbed by an Italian immigrant on the 25th of June 19, 1894. Okay. So another president was stabbed. At the time, there was a very strong anti-Italian atmosphere in France. And the, the Italian shops were destroyed and Italians were attacked in the street. And it wasn't good to be Italian at the time. And the Russians are really worried that that's going to happen against them. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be made responsible as a community for the actions of an individual. Yeah, quite. But strangely, none of that happens in France in 1932. There's only one case of a stabbing of a Russian docker by a French docker. Oh, okay. But we don't even know exactly why. What the motivation It could was. have been something completely different and related, mm -hmm. but that's the only case of violence against the Russian that is known in 1932. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't happen like uh, against the Italians. Of course, people were making comments against Russians and yeah. being disparaging, but it, it doesn't matter that much. That might explain why... Um, oh, his name escapes me, the guy that stole the Mona Lisa that you talked about a couple of episodes ago. Uh -huh. Why he had a real chip in his shoulder about how he was treated in um, in France. I mean, that was kind of. If like, it had been at the time, yes, because we're talking eighteen ninety four, so that's well, what that's fifteen years before he stole the Mona Lisa. He stole the Mona Lisa at nineteen eleven, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's about mm. fifteen years before. So I don't know if he had been in France at the time because he wasn't old. So I don't know, but no. maybe it were, there was still mm. an anti-Italian sentiment in France. Yeah. I don't know at mm -hmm. the time possible anyway that's a digression uh, yes yes um the russian community is trying really hard to distance itself from the assassination so they have they write open letters in the newspapers to explain their point of view and they send condolences telegrams to the widow and they have public meetings and orthodox mass and everything they're trying really hard to show that they are with the french people not with the assassin yeah no that's probably and it a seems wise, to work okay yeah so probably a wise stance to take uh, yes the affair is obviously politicized because that's what happens of course it was in particular the by the communist party and the, and the, the communist press in france mm -hmm. They received orders daily from Comintern, so from Moscow, on what to do, how to behave, and what to say. Right. So they do what they are told. And they are trying really hard to pin the assassination on the right Russians because they want the international community to turn against the white Russians, who are yeah. still active at the time in Russia. Mm, yeah. L'Humanité, for example, which is the communist newspaper, which still exists, accuses the white Russians of having orchestrated the assassination with a view to push, push the USSR towards war against his, its neighbors. Mm -hmm. They even accused the French government to have organized the assassination to prepare the public opinion for a massive cleansing of revolutionary ideas. Mm. So they do their propaganda. The burial of Paul Dumer takes place on the 12th of May 1932. The the whole country was silent at the time, apparently. Okay. The procession has people lining the streets across Paris. And it seems a bit strange now how it works. I don't think that would be the case for, uh, let's say, Macron was assassinated. But because at the time the president was really for show, sure, mm. um, some commentators at the time say that he didn't have the power to take uh, unpopular measures. So, of course, everybody loves him. Oh, yes. So it, it is a very different world from, from now where you have... Oh, yeah. You uh, have to make president. unpopular decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. in France, you have a, a weird system where both the president and the prime minister have power. Yeah. Some of them overlapping, which causes problems. But that's all because of the goal. So it's the only country in the world that has both a strong president who's the head of the executive and mm -hmm. a strong prime minister who's the head of legislative. Yeah, that could At the clash. same time, yeah. that doesn't happen. You have one president like in the US mm -hmm. and you have no prime minister or you have a prime minister like in the UK or in Italy, mm. but you have a queen or a president for sure. Yeah. There's only one country in the, world that, in the world that has both and it doesn't really work very well, but it has worked since 1958. So people try to find out what the motivations really were because he's just talking nonsense about um, being a, the, the France being in, in a conspiracy against yeah. um, Russian ideas or whatever. So he, in killing Dumer, he says that he wanted to punish France and attract attention 
to what was happening to the Russian people. So he's now shifting a little bit his motivation by saying mm -hmm. that he wanted to protect the people, not to show his ideas. Mm. In, in that he succeeded, I guess, because people talked about him. So yeah. it worked. He managed yeah. to attract attention. I guess a little bit, yeah. Yeah, but it's only temporary because the, the country at the time wasn't that interested in what was happening in Russia. The, as I said earlier, the financial crisis was starting to hit in, in France. Yeah. France wasn't that hit that hard in, in the 30s because of the 1929 financial crisis because mm. of the way the country was run. It was what the Americans would call the socialist country, with the, the still called socialist country. So the whole economy was planned. And it, if you plan in advance and things work out, mm. then it doesn't really matter what happens to your neighbors. So, so the, the the crisis didn't really hit hard, but people were worried that it could. Okay. Also, they were starting to worry a little bit about the fascist groups that were taking actions here and there. And yeah. e even in our first, second or first or first episode, the woman that was stabbed in the subway station oh, yes. in the twenties, uh -huh. her links to far right fascist groups were. Oh, yes. uh -huh considered as a possible motivation so the, the small uh, extreme groups are starting to get mm. more and more power at the time so that worries people more than what happens in russia yeah well germany was a lot closer in there was... yes and hitler wasn't in power yet but was no. starting to make quite a lot of noise yes well because of the large indemnity that they had to pay post uh yes world war one yes. and uh, the occupation of the yeah. uh, the renani yes um they found lots of texts at his place, in his hotel room, mm -hmm. and they all show that he really thought that he was doing a patriotic action by killing Dumer. Okay. During his trial, the, his lawyers, who were appointed lawyers, um, what are they called in the US? Public, whatever. Defenders. Public, Public defenders, defenders yeah. yeah. So that's what they were, but they tried really hard to, to save his head. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have much to work with, but no. they decide that the best approach is to... What, say that he's nuts? Insanity, yeah, oh, essentially, yeah. yes. Calling him nuts. This is me using the kind of light terminology that would have been used at the time. Oh, yeah, probably, yes. And um, the trial starts on the 26th of July, 1932. Mm -hmm. special, special measures have been taken to maintain order during the trial. They didn't want things to go a bit crazy. In kangaroo court. Yeah, and also people trying to, whatever... Disrupt, disrupt the mm. the proceedings. So there's a big police presence in a lot of in soap, and around the court. Yeah, a lot of soapbox. Uh, yes. Actions. Yeah. The, the 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 press predicts that the the trial would be worthy of Dostoevsky. So everybody expects a big show, a big thing. Yeah. Um, the Italian and the British and American newspapers even try to get the rights to publish his books or extracts from his books. Whereas in, in France, nobody cared. Mm. The trial, the tribunal could have accepted the plea of insanity, maybe, because the way he behaved in prison clearly showed it was, he was totally nuts. One minute he was lecturing the guards with mystical, patriotical, political prophecies. Mm -hmm. And the next minute he would just be mute and read the Bible. We okay. just stop talking read the Bible for like an hour or two, and then start again. It was yeah, it acted nuts. So I mean, it, it could be plausible that he actually did receive a head wound from this uh, grenade in the first yes, world war. Yes, it's possible. There's no proof of it, but maybe it did happen, and maybe mm -hmm. it had an impact. It's possible. Yeah. Who knows? The his lawyers at the tribunal uh, request that the tri the tribunal uh, organizes a psychological evaluation. Okay. They do. Doctors and psychiatrists come and talk to him and examine him and test him and, and all that. And they say that they don't find any trace of insanity in the sense of Article 64 of the Penal Code. We've talked about that article before. Mm -hmm. It says that if you can't understand your actions, you can't be tried for them. Yeah. And it defines a number of rules that mm -hmm. would justify that. But they say, no, it doesn't match Article 64. We can't call him crazy f from a legal point of view. Seems quite narrow. Yeah, but you have to define what insanity is, yes. and that's how they defined it. I and guess so. they say it doesn't match; he's not insane in a legal legal way. So he's, he's declared responsible for his actions, and therefore can be tried. Mm -hmm. His lawyers order a counter evaluation, 
and these doctors find that he's totally pathological, delirious, and very well capable of regicide. Okay. So the exact opposite of what the court yeah, doctors um, found. Oh, that's not really that surprising, yes. is it? Even Freud is asked to testify. Wow. And he says that, yes, it's a classical Oedipus complex, and he considers... Um, Dumer to be the father and France to be the the mother, the, the mother and he wanted to <laughs> save the mother and all that crap. So, so yes, even fairly big names have been involved yeah. in the in the case. Well, once again, I mean, it was a very high profile yeah. case. So and as a result, his lawyers argue that he's not responsible for his actions and therefore can be tried. So, a diminished responsibility. Then. Yes, and name he used to buy his ticket for the book show. Oh yes, Pred. Yes, means delirious in Russian. Right, okay. So, uh, that, so that's why it's an important name. Yeah, it doesn't sound like the, the actions of a madman. That sounds kind of calculated. Some of it obviously is calculated, yes, but how much of it is crazy, I don't know. Mm. So there's no special case in the penal code for assassination of a president. president doesn't mm, because have a special not figurehead status even. in the penal code. Okay, because they're not really, I mean have any power as such, I guess. No, and it would be the same for a minister. Ministers yeah. don't have a special status in the penal code either. There's Article 86 at the time, which covers the assassination of the emperor and his family, which not was created from Napoleon. But yeah. at the time, in 1932, it was considered invalid and not yeah. used anymore. Mm. And it was repealed on the 29th of July, 1939, so a few years later. Mm -hmm. So he can't be tried under any special circumstances, so he's just tried as a normal murderer. Mm-hmm. The prosecution tries really hard to requalify the assassination as non politically uh, non politically motivated because there are articles in the penal code that cover political crimes and if you are found guilty of political crimes you can't be beheaded you don't the death penalty doesn't apply to you okay so they don't want that to happen so they try really hard to show that he was just crazy he was just wanting to kill people. He was okay. not doing it politically. Even though he was doing it politically. <laughs> yes. So they try really hard to rephrase what he's done uh -huh. so that it doesn't apply. But Gogolov and his lawyers still try to appeal against that representation of what he did. And the high court refuses the, the appeal by saying that political crimes don't cover assassination. So if you steal... If you destroy and you manage to show it as a political crime, you can't be sentenced to death. If you kill someone, that doesn't apply. You're still a murderer. So he's, again, after the appeal, tried as a murderer. Yeah. Following the, the, the prosecutor's request for the death penalty, Gogolov is sentenced to death on the 27th of July. No special or mitigated circumstances are considered. So it's just... That's murderer it. sentenced to death. He's going to get his hair cut. Yes. His lawyer appeals to the new president, who's Alper Lebrun, for a pardon. Mm -hmm. But on the 13th of, this, of September, the president refuses. If you remember, in one of the first episodes, we talked about the laws that were in the 1910s, mm -hmm. mid-1910s, in Parliament to abolish the death penalty. Oh, yes, it almost went through. Almost went through until the president pardoned a few murderers, and, and that changes the, changed the opinion, and yeah. it was just filed, and mm -hmm. it was only then found again, let's say, in 1975. I think it was 75. Um, the death penalty was abolished in 1981, but mm -hmm. the proceedings took many, many years. That started around the mid-70s. But anyway, um, so that president doesn't want to make the same mistake. No. So he knows the public opinion is not going to be happy if he pardons the murderer. No. So he refuses to pardon him. So Well, not if the guy was popular as well. I mean, that would have been such yes. a bad That would move. have been a bad political move, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So he refuses on the on, uh, 17th of September. On the 14th of September, so the next day at 5.57 a.m., they don't waste time. Yeah. He's decapitated in front of the prison. 3,000 people watch the execution. Wow. Apparently, it was one of the fastest executions ever. Well, uh, yeah. It took about 10 seconds between him appearing out of the cart that got him to the guillotine out of the prison. Okay. And his head being separated from his body, so less than 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Not a minute 
before his head was in the basket and the basket taken away. I mean, I guess they probably just wanted to move on with it and just... Yeah, they don't want to yeah. take risks with uh, the public trying to overtake the... Yeah. Like what happened in a few years earlier, we mentioned it when there were people um, breaching the police barrier and yes. trying to collect the blood and all that. that. So they didn't madness. want any of that to, uh, to yeah. happen. The um, the guillotine was gone within minutes mm. as well, and yeah. the, the street clean. It was yep. su super super fast. The executioner, which we knew um, already from a lot of previous cases, because he was the official executioner in France, was Debler, mm -hmm. and he mentioned that his head was badly shaped. Nobody knows why he <laughs> says that. He never explained it, but it's possible that the blade didn't go in right and went sideways or hit bones <laughs> or whatever. We don't know. But he mentioned that his head was not shaped properly. Well, <laughs> he had a Rubik's Cube head that, who, knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? So the question of the existence of a plot doesn't go away because it's mentioned during the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mentioned in the press. The, and it's especially the case because Dumer is the first 20th century prison to be assassinated and the last, I think, to be successfully assassinated. So people start try to understand, and w was he acting alone, was he not acting alone, what was going on. Also, the assassination took place two days before the second round of general elections, which was predicting a left-wing tsunami, which did happen. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe uh, some group decided to change the direction of the elections by organizing an assassination, which would have moved possibly the, the people to the far right as a reaction. Yeah, but that didn't work. That didn't clearly. happen, but maybe. So that's one of the reasons people think it might be a plot. Also, Dumer was, n n was known to support rearmament against Germany because he could see that Germany was becoming a threat. So he wanted France to rearm. And it, at the time, it wasn't prepared for a war and wasn't in 39 anyway. So also people were thinking, could it be Germany that was behind that? Because by killing him who wanted to rearm the country, maybe the next president, president wouldn't, yeah. and therefore France wouldn't be ready. Again, one of the reasons why people want to know if it was a plot or not. An inquiry is open and led by the instructing judge of the assassination, mm -hmm. uh, Judge Fougerie, but his conclusion is that there's definitely only action of a single assassin. There's no plot, no group involved. There's no need to worry about anything. Essentially, that's that. But uh, a lot uh, of people consider it wash wash. It's, yeah, it wasn't I'm, done seriously. I, think, I mean, I think humans just like to look for patterns and, and have an explanation for everything and a good, reasonably rational explanation. And I, I think in this case, there just wasn't. The guy was just... It was just crazy. Yeah. I think he was, yeah. Was, sadly, I think he was... As I keep saying nuts. I mean, he obviously was... Mm -hmm. I think probably something happened to him. There. But so that's it. That's the assassination of prison Dumer in France. Yeah, 1932. I think you have to think the sad thing is don't look for self-fulfilling prophecies because sometimes they come true. 